Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and yes, so I'm sort of taking us a little bit further back in time here after Izzy um, so eloquently discussed aspects of the Magdalenian. Uh, I'd like to try and sort of open this out slightly and, and run with that idea in this session, I think, of uh, hunter-gatherer worlds. And I think that idea of hunter-gatherers and actually could extend, depending on exactly how loosely or tightly you define that, into the order of millions of years. But the picture I always see is that we really talk about a relatively short time span in the grand scheme of things. And I find this really, really interesting. Do we have theoretical tools which are sensitive to the real temporality uh, of fun to gather a world? It is what we purport to talk about. So, uh, very quickly, what I'll try and talk about and cover in this talk is I'll start with a little bit of that chronology, some of that challenge, which I find quite interesting for this. Um, I want to try and talk about hominins in particular and sort of think about earlier hominins as well. Um, and are they actually complex enough to understand and have a relational world? This, I think, is really important as we try to shift between human evolutionary narratives and then uh, more sort of relational narratives. The difference is its scale here in sort of tempo across species and temporalities involved. Um, I see some bias in this, and I'll sort of discuss what I mean by that. Um, I then shift gear and try and talk about in soft focus. I don't want to sort of repeat what Izzy's already talked about, again, so eloquently. But in essence, as Izzy supervisor, of course, I kind of do much the same thing. So that's kind of my take on this. Thank you, Izzy. You just bought me five minutes. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll pay you in the pub later. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about cases in the end. That isn't entirely the focus. So my discussion here of data is relatively in soft focus compared to many of the other papers we'll see today, I'm sure. Um, this is more an invitation for us collectively to start to think about this. And it's going to add a few cheeky nuggets, really. Uh, a seasoning of data. Uh, and then I will, I will conclude, of course, as well. Uh, okay, so I want to start with that chronology. And again, assuming here that not everyone is a Paleolithic archaeologist, I'll give you a little chunk of um, some, some rough movements through time here. I think, arguably, you could say that anything on this very rapid map here, which starts in the sort of millions of years and very rapidly speeds up through many cultural changes and many different species, uh, much of which is debated, of course. Any of these, you could argue, is a hunter-gatherer, in the sense that there's some evidence that they're possibly hunted, getting, of course, more ambiguous at the top end, top end of the map there, uh, and gathered as well. So in that sense, they had a hunter-gatherer life way, a hunter-gatherer world. Then, in terms of our session here, then, they're in it. Right? They had a hunter-gatherer world. But where does our theory stretch to? I would argue we have some amazing people doing some amazing work in the Paleolithic, Chantal Canella, John Paprani, I would include you in this, your wonderful paper, uh, Time and Mind. Very enjoyed that. Um, Izzy, of course, fantastic research. And dare I say, my own PhD a few years ago, where I started to play with this a little bit, where I dipped my toe in, in the Magdalenian, a period I'd never worked in before. It was very cool. I enjoyed that. Um, so I would argue there's this lovely green-ish uh, hard, hard square, where I think this is core relationality territory. This is where we see a lot of our work, really. It's from sort of tail end of the pile into the Holocene. Okay, humans, ah, we get humans. Contemporary animals we can observe, ah, we get that. We've got clear uh, points of analogy then. Okay, upper pile, ah, they're still humans like us. That's cool, we can do that. Many of the animals, ah, they're still sort of contemporary. A few extinct ones in there as well. A cheeky woolly rhino chucked into the mix. What would we do with that? No idea. Analogies, African rhino? Okay, African rhino. So again, you're stretching it back a bit. And go beyond that, we start to take in broader species. We think about Neanderthals, for example, Denisovans, new cheeky chappy on the sea. Um, Theresiensis, very interesting. But do we really have a particular framework to explore those species? In the same way, I would argue the tempo uh, of argument shifts in this, and really relationality kind of doesn't exist in the same way for me yet. Though I would argue it, it absolutely can. And this is really the, the focus of what I'm trying to talk about here. So for me, I think there's this huge untapped potential, and we've got wonderful tools that are really focused toward the tail end of our temporal range when it comes to the hunter-gatherer life way and hunter-gatherer worlds. There are many of them for many species, and I find this really fascinating. <coughs> so... What is the problem? Why is that? Where is the, the hominin relationality? Now, I'm trying to sort of model this. This is kind of like my mind, if I could stick it onto a slide at the moment. So I'm not sure this is necessarily right, but this is sort of my thinking of it. And I think you kind of have, you know, this classic sort of triad of relationships that you see in relational terms, usually. It's humans, non-human animals, 
and objects. Plants, I think, usually get roped in somewhere between your non-human animal and your objects. They're kind of not quite animal in how you relate to them. They're not quite object in how you relate to them. The arguments come up somewhere woodly in the middle. Uh, hominins, I think, are kind of the same as plants in a way, weirdly, between humans and non-human animals. In that, I think, to sort of totally hijack Rain Willislev's uh, term here, uh, and, and use it for my own purposes, um, they come out sort of not human, but not not human either. They kind of get caught somewhere between humans and non-human animals, and it's kind of because we have these huge human evolutionary debates about cognition, where they sit. Are they human enough uh, and clever enough to enter into humanity? And so then we can start to talk about them in complex relational terms. Or are they too stupid? And so we push them further down the order, and they're passive, they're more receptive, they're part of the natural world. Um, and I think this is a really important debate, and usually we get caught right in the middle. And that is where we end up using uh, data and evidence to try and prove capacities. Did they have a mind most, most complex enough? Do they have the cognitive potential required to do something? This is rendered all the more difficult, I'd argue, and here I shift to the green dotty boxes, uh, where I think um, it's particularly difficult for us to see this and to plot this and to explore this by virtue of our contemporary engagement with these species, being as these hominins as objects. And so weirdly, they kind of touch on all three bases by virtue of the time involved. You don't see these hominins running around anymore. You don't see the extinct animals they hunted running around anymore either. And so the challenge becomes how we really plug in and use the right types of analogies to unpick that. If we go down from a strictly human evolutionary approach into a more contextual approach, how do you actually unpick and find the right analogies uh, and the right means to explore that? So the obvious question is, are they cognitively complex enough? I would argue, we've actually already got the answer to that in some ways, in that relationality, it's generally two-way relationships, you kind of have the answer. In that sense, animals have always been a part of two-way discourse and relationality. So from the point of view of cognition and relationality, I don't necessarily think it's an issue. I kind of think wherever they sit on that, they should be able to engage in those relational um, relationships. The key is, can we understand them by virtue of them being sort of not observable as a species? Can we find the right tools to actually unpick that? But I'm thinking here about something like a theory of mind, for example. That capacity to model and understand another's mind, a capacity to understand and model uh, other parts of the world uh, and your place within it. Uh, and for me, um, certainly by the time you get towards theory of mind level four and five, if you're sort of archaic humans, uh, early Neanderthals, um, you have a, a capacity for abstraction, for example. And so this is important, if this is important, if we think that humans impose these understandings on the world, rather than being realised from the ground up, I would argue they probably still pass that test as well, in that they're just as cognitively complex as we are at the tail end of this, going backwards, Homo erectus, perhaps a bit more debatable there, but notice even sort of your chimpanzee has that capacity to think of their own mind and someone else's mind. So you'd argue some species enter this quite naturally as well. Um, some carnivores have relatively advanced theory of mind as well. So we can use this, I think, as a very crude tool to understand that complex social relations existed in the past. They existed for early hominins, as much as they do for humans now. And that was never limited to just humans or just hominins. This is a mistake, I think, we work with a social brain model. Um, I think that they naturally gravitate and flow beyond that to animals, other parts of landscape and objects. And that's where you get that capacity for abstraction being quite key in those later phases as well. <laughs> so for me, I think they pass that twist quite readily, though, of course, you know, feel free to disagree. Um, I said there was bias here, of course, as well. There is. And I think for me, we look at Neanderthals, of course, we now know from the DNA evidence, which launched about 2010, that they're interbred with humans. So the idea that we had humans at this special um, output at the end, the winners of the great evolutionary race, isn't quite true. Um, and that makes the whole thing more complicated in that we've argued about Neanderthals in one way and humans in another. I'm sort of just fixating on Neanderthals here as one example, an obvious example, where there's one, there's many more. I think that's true of many of the hominin species throughout the record as well. We have a lot of assumptions about this by virtue of what we'd argue is a special type of human exceptionalism. And we can kind of model this in that, that red line of extinction. And here I sort of am picking up on a theme I talked about in 2016 at TAG in Southampton, where I said there's real biases in the out record for Neanderthals. I still think that, and I think, um, this is kind of my 
cheeky attempt to, to fix some of it. Um, but that human exceptionalism for me is, is very present. Anyone that doesn't pass through that line, here we're talking about sort of pre-2010. Stupid, they must have something wrong with them, quite not as um, sort of fully gifted as contemporary humans. Uh, and so we can sort of wash away them and have, have to worry about them in the same way. Relationality, perhaps a key trait only humans have. Only they can appreciate. Um, Nemtel's complex, no doubt, but not so complex that they survive into the contemporary. So there must be something lacking, something missing. Of course, you add on a splash of interbreeding, humans, Nemtel's, and Denisovans, and what you get is a very different pattern where it's like, whoops, how do we fix this? Rapidly, quickly. Uh, update your models because they're no longer this purity of species as interbreeding between them. And funny enough, a proliferation of complex material culture, including artistic expression, crops in the last 10 years or so. So more in the last 10 years than perhaps the, the previous hundreds put together. And so I'd argue then, by this uh, logic, we need a relationality of early hominid species because it's far more complex than we ever thought. So with Neanderthals, that takes us back at least an extra 100,000 uh, years uh, on top of um, our user's upper power model for relationality. So already we have a big void here which has been opened up by the DNA evidence, if we only attribute this to, sort of, to humans. So, very rapidly then, I'll touch on some themes. I'll, I'll sort of take up my own invitation to fill that 100,000 year chunk I just opened up for myself, which is very convenient. Um, and I'll do that with a couple of examples. One, I'll look at some what I'll call sort of bird art. And the other I'll look at Stone art. These are not real terms. I just made them up for, for my own purposes. Um, but I'll lump them together into a series of um, lumps. There is not so much stone art that isn't strictly true. It's just I'm going to cover one because I will run out of time. Uh, the bird art's what I want to try and focus on. I'm trying to focus on Nentel human uh, animal relationships. So, yes, insert Izzy's wonderful theory here. And then what I think then, with sort of like what are very well published papers, of course, the main Nentel's. They're pretty, they're awkward, they have feathers in their hair, talons around their necks. This, for me, I think is, is a good image of what Nantel's all about these days. Uh, but I think the species that they're, they're trying to um, exploit uh, is, is really interesting. So as has already been published, as I say, it's those species potentially with black feathers. It's those species that are quite rare, such as golden eagles or other predatory species, uh, that are even quite rare in the landscape. Um, but they seem to be targeting that quite selectively. Um, current argument still holds that this is without a, a significant sort of dietary component here or dietary motivation. It's quite selective within the range of species that you might have encountered, we think. Um, so I do wonder why they're doing that. And for me, there's perhaps a depth here of, of seeing and observing animals in the world, their behaviours, their rhythms, their patterns, predatory species, or species which share a colour that they themselves might daub themselves with, in this case sort of using charcoal, you share particular capacities. So maybe building new types of um, categories, some points of connection and some point of dissimilarity here between different species. Moving focus to Crepina, notice a jump backwards here by over 100,000 years. A massive, massive pattern if we believe these things are all connected. This is a perpetual thing. It could be something that's sort of realised again and again. But again, white-tailed white -tailed eagle, um, A, it doesn't sound like a huge sample size, but that's a lot of white-tailed eagle you manage to find in a, a, a landscape. You know? um, and again, in this case, exploitation, that doesn't seem to be linked to something dietary. I suppose you could try and eat white-tailed white eagle if you, if you wanted to, but I think it's probably more obvious things you could eat. Um, and I think with this then, they're focusing on what I would argue to be sort of action elements. And of course, there I'm thinking sort of, of my own particular sort of biases in the first pose, a sort of animistic ontology and animistic framework, that link between what animals do, their potency. Um, thinking about Hill and people like that, really, that you've already sort of discussed. Um, but feathers linked to flying, perhaps, um, and talons linked to hunting, things that have potency in the world and what they do, uh, that link to colour, where again, they're already sort of daubing themselves in ochre as well. And again, a new sort of raft with this similar theme, it's exploitation of the talons, different region, different time periods. So we've seen this again and again. Uh, and excitingly, we're starting to see people start to sort of join the dots here and bring this together into a cohesive body of data. We're not quite there yet with this. But I think, partly, with the right tool set, with an emerging data set, which will happen very rapidly, I think, it's very exciting. So, 
final example, um, to switch just to a different type of material rather than just focus on, on birdiness the whole time, okay, um, is La Roche de Tadma. Now, I wanted to use this one on purpose just because it's the one that you'd usually get pre sort of DNA evidence where reluctantly people would give themselves some credit cognitively. Fine, I suppose they can maybe make a cheeky bit of art then. Give them this, a really simple face. The form was already there. They've kind of put a cheeky bit of bone in. Ah, oh, fine. It's kind of art, isn't it? Well, yes, but actually, in this new appreciation of our early Hawaiian ancestors, perhaps it's far more than that. I'm thinking, of course, here of Maka Panscat as well, that pebble with a suggestive facial form, dating to over two million years ago. So I use this very suggestively, that this could be a very old pattern with a mind to see it this way. You have a suggestive form which is partially modified. The flute, the hole in the middle is, is, is completely natural. It's a very suggestive shape. And I wonder if they're wrapped in that suggestiveness. And in this instance, the material is quite active in the resultant art shaped uh, and produced. And so for me, I wonder if there are any complex relationships between animals and the Neanderthal, the particular uh, potent actions that they perform links to the material products produced. And in this instance, the native form, which is suggested and built on and negotiated to build a composite product uh, in this case. Um, now, yes, so to conclude finally, <coughs> do we perhaps talk about them? Then tell animal object relationships. Can this happen? I think so. I think it's very good. Uh, notice, of course, a hidden example, which I hope proves my point, which is the background image itself, which is El Castillo. Um, of course, this was once thought to be human. Very complex. It must be very complex in how they paint their hands on the wall here. Neanderthal, this predated probably now Neanderthal. Yeah, they painted some stuff. They probably had complex cognition. Good. You know, so very complex differences in how we choose to talk about this between these different species. Uh, and so for me, I think we start to go further than this. I do think we can apply a relational tool set. Um, and here we're switching down really in gears from a human evolutionary model where we try to prove cognitive complexity yeah. and instead think about a species for what it is and think about what it was doing in the world, particular moments in time. I need to go backwards in time, explore other species. I've picked the most obvious, but let's challenge ourselves and try it further back. And think about things that aren't just art, also a really obvious one for me trying to make a point about cognition here, of course. But hunting strategies with different species that are no longer extant in the world. How exciting to try that, right? Um, so for me, there's a great deal more to do. And of course, to reinterpret El Castillo, because you've not done justice on that front either. Thank you very much. <laughs>